This is the airfoil section of our aeronautical engineering lesson, part one. A typical wing has a cross section that looks like this. Notice it's a little further for the air to travel over the top of the wing than it travels under the bottom of the wing. This is the front of the wing, this is the back of the wing. If you were to draw the whole airplane, you'd have the leading edge here, the trailing edge there, the fuselage there, the engine there, the tail back there, the wheels down here. Okay, the air flowing over the top travels further and consequently faster than the air flowing under the wing. This increase in fluid speed above the wing results in a decrease in pressure according to Bernoulli's principle. Bernoulli's principle, well, it's a formula. We won't get into it right now. But basically, when a fluid, when the velocity of a fluid increases, its pressure has to decrease because of the law of conservation of energy. You can't get something for nothing. So pressure times change in volume, that's the, the a certain type of energy that a fluid has, and its velocity, that results in kinetic energy. So if you increase the kinetic energy, you have to decrease the pressure times change in volume energy and the volume doesn't change appreciably so the pressure has to drop. Okay here's an upside down wing see how it says upside down wing there doesn't really look all that upside down but the air has to flow a little further this way than it has to flow that way so you'd think that an upside down wing would be pulling the plane down plus the way the planes would really go down but if you have a great enough angle of attack and the air is coming this way you can fly upside down it's not the most efficient way to get through the air but if you can get the air to become deflected down you can obtain lift that's what it's all about action and reaction get the air to go that way the airplane goes the other way according to Newton's one of his laws. Any airfoil that deflects air downward will generate lift. See, here's our air coming along. We didn't draw an airfoil in there, but no matter what you draw in there, if it makes the air do that, it'll give you lift. Okay, if you draw a line from the leading point right there to the trailing point of a wing, and the top of the wing is further from the line. See right there, the top of that wing is further from this line than the bottom of the wing is. Then you have a cambered wing. Most airplanes have cambered main wings up front and a non-cambered or symmetric airfoil for the tail of the airplane. Now, Bert Rattan, he likes to make airplanes that have a little wing up front and a big wing in the back and they both lift, but typically you'll see a big wing up front and a small airfoil in the back and the big wing lifts the weight of the plane plus a little bit and the tail of the plane pushes down on the plane. This is because the center of gravity is always in front of where the wing lifts. That gives us stability. Okay, if the top of the wing is the same distance from the cord as the bottom is, then you have a symmetric wing. See here? This goes up about like that. This goes down the exact same amount. The top of it's always the same distance from the middle that the bottom is. And that's a symmetric wing. <clears throat> Generally, a cambered airfoil is used as the main wing. <coughs> yeah, okay, now we're talking about what I said a while ago, and a symmetric airfoil is used for the tail of an airplane. Aerobatic airplanes often use symmetric main wings because they fly as well upside down as they do right side up. Sometimes a four-digit code is used to describe an airfoil. For instance, here's a 2312 airfoil. Okay, the cord is a straight line that goes from the leading point to the trailing point. Yeah, we discussed that a second ago. The camber line is the imaginary line that is always the same distance from the top of the wing that it is from the bottom of the wing. See here, there's the 
cord line, that straight one right there. There's the camber line. It curves up a little bit. Okay. The first digit, 2, of the 2312 airfoil tells you that the distance between the camber line and the cord at the camber's highest point is 2% of the distance from the leading point to the trailing point. See there, that distance there between the camber line and the cord line, that little teeny distance, that's 2% of this distance from the leading point to the trailing point of the cord line. Okay. Okay, in other words, if you have a 2312 airfoil with a 50 inch cord, the camber line at its furthest distance from the cord will be one inch above the cord. See here? There's the curved camber line. There's the straight cord line. The camber line is one inch above the cord line because this is a 50 inch airfoil. The second digit, three, of the 2312 airfoil indicates that the camber line is furthest from the cord line at 30% of the way from the leading edge there to the trailing edge. So if there's 0%, there's 100% of the way from the leading edge to the trailing edge. Well, there would be 50% and about there would be 30%. So this 2312 has its camber line furthest away from the cord at 30% of the way back from here to there. The last two digits from the leading edge to the trailing edge, <coughs> uh, one, two, <coughs> indicate that the wing's maximum thickness is 12% of the cord. In other words, this 2312 airfoil would be six inches thick if its cord is 50 inches thick. Okay, so from the bottom of the wing to the top of the wing would be 6 inches. If you have a 50 inch wing, it would be 12 inches if you have a 100 inch wing. Notice that the 2312 designation doesn't tell you how big a wing is. It can be a wing on a jet liner or a little radio controlled airplane. It doesn't matter. All that 2312 tells you is how it's shaped relatively. Okay, as you can see this camber line is halfway between the top and the bottom. Its distance from there to there is equal to its distance from there to there. Its distance from there to there is equal to its distance from there to there. And it starts out at the same point that the cord line starts out. It goes up above the cord and ends up at the same point that the cord line ends at. If, if all of the pressures acting on an airfoil were represented by one force vector, that force vector would be through a point called the center of pressure. The center of pressure of a symmetric airfoil is generally near 25% of the cord. That's 25% of the way from the wing's leading edge to the wing's trailing edge. The center of pressure of a symmetric airfoil stays at the 25% cord position even when the wing's angle of attack and consequently its lift coefficient changes. But on a cambered wing, the center of pressure moves forward at high angles of attack and moves backward at lower angles of attack. The graph on page 5, that is this graph. We'll look more at it soon. Shows that the center of pressure of a NACA 2312 wing is at about 27% cord at high angles of attack. In other words, from about 12 to 20 degrees angle of attack, the center of pressure is at 27% of the cord. Let's look at it here. There we go. See, there's the, the whole graph, but We'll pull it up a little. Okay. See at about 12 to 20 percent or 12 to 20 degrees angle of attack. You go up here to this little line. This little one that's not too thick. 
comes along here, goes a little bit underneath that lift, lift over drag line, it crosses it, comes down here. Okay, that shows where the center of pressure is. And notice it's about 70% of the way from that line to that line. Well, we go over to the left, that line is 20% of the way back from the leading edge of the wing. See that zero, that's the leading point of the cord. That 100, that's the trailing edge of the wing. So if we're 70% of the way from that line to that line, well then we're 70% of the way from 20% to 30%. See, it doesn't say 30, but it says 40 right there. And you know that one halfway between 20 and 40 is 30. So 27% of the way back is where the center of pressure is at a high angle of attack. But on a cambered wing, let's see. Ah, oh, that's enough lesson for we're about to run out of time. We'll get back on this subject at part two airfoils of aeronautical engineering.